Jim, first let me congratulate you on the new edition of Crossfire. It's outstanding. Thank you. Now, let's start from your final conclusion uh, in this case, which you've researched so well, and work our way back from there. The question is, who benefited the most, and who had the power to subvert a truthful investigation? That now leads you to the truth of the assassination. And what is the truth? Well, the truth is, is that uh, the evidence is clear that at the level of the federal government, there were these crimes committed in connection with the Kennedy assassination. Suppression of evidence, destruction of evidence, fabrication of evidence, alteration of evidence, and intimidation of witnesses. So, well, then who's guilty in the Kennedy assassination? And it comes down, I can give you two names. These are people who, in a fair and honest courtroom, could be found guilty. And that is his successor, Lyndon Baines Johnson, and his next-door neighbor and buddy, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI. Now, can I prove that those two men orchestrated or ordered the assassination? No, I cannot. But what I can prove beyond any deniability is the fact that these two men both took actions that blocked any meaningful investigation into what actually happened, which makes them accessories after the fact. Right. Case closed. If you look at it from the bottom up, whoever killed him, whoever passed the gun, who was driving the cars, low-level people, you know, uh, if that was all there was to it, uh, then any good investigation would have uncovered all this. But when you consider that the cover-up is handled at the absolute highest level of political power in the United States, then it becomes clear on how they were able to misdirect any truthful investigation. Right. Uh, and, then you, and then you go back and you find that on the Monday following the Friday assassination, just the day after Oswald had been killed in the basement of the police station, uh, we get Nicholas Katzen back, who, uh, who running the Justice Department for the grieving Bobby Kennedy, right. uh, you know, writes a note and says, you know, the thing we must do is prove that Oswald is, was the lone assassin. Uh, same thing with John J. McCloy. Uh, very powerful member of the Council of Foreign Relations meetings, he said, uh, the thing that is of paramount importance is we must prove to the world that America is not a banana republic where, where the government can be changed by conspiracy. That's why they came up with their uh, lone assassin theory, which was nothing more than a theory. In fact, there are, as you well know, innumerable facts and evidence which point <laughs> to the opposite direction than the lone assassin. When you look at where the state of this case is now, you know, we have the public and poll after poll, over 70% believe it was a conspiracy, and the establishment and the corporate media pushing back. That's right. The people aren't buying it. I'll tell you where we are and where we're going. Uh, I'm often asked, will we ever know the truth about the Kennedy assassination? And I try to tell them, you're not asking the right question, uh, you know, because we know the truth right now. What you're actually asking is that, will there come a day when they'll have a national press conference and some, uh, you know, leading government figure will get up and say, okay, okay, here's what really happened to Kennedy. No. That ain't going to happen, all right? There's just too much involved, uh, too many people's reputations, too many institutions' uh, reputations. It, it ain't going to happen. Right. But as far as do we know the truth, we know the truth right now. Uh, and all you have to do is study the facts of the case. Well, let's take a look at some of the more unusual and very telling aspects of this. So we'll start at the movie theater where the cops have gathered to find a suspect in the shooting of Officer Tippett. Uh, which they will tie into the JFK murder, but some unusual things were happening there at the Texas Theater. Uh, can you walk us through that? Yeah. Well, we're we'll talking about the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, first, the whole thing is just pretty, uh, you know, outrageous just on the surface. Uh, we're, we're Basically, we're told that, uh, uh, you know, the President of the United States had just been assassinated in their city, and one of their own uh, police department uh, officers had been he got shot in South Oak Cliff, and, uh, and so the whole city's in a buzz. And then the police dispatcher gets a call from the Texas Theater. He said a man may have sneaked in without paying his admission. 
Well, they rushed 15 squad cars, assistant district attorneys, some FBI people, uh, and including men who claimed they were CIA. We don't know who uh. they were. Uh, and all of them, they go out and surround the theater. And the next thing you know, uh, they haul out uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and uh, rush him down to the police station. Right. Um, there's a going slightly off topic here. This there there's a, in regards to this, there's a very small little detail. But then the devil's in the details, and also we're kind of of the general idea we have. The public has the general idea that circumstantial evidence is is you know not all that good. What we want is the hard evidence, the fingerprint, the smoking gun. So what I'm getting at is is that. According to FBI documents that were released in the 1980s, two hours after the shooting in Dallas, J. Edgar Hoover is on the telephone to Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General, and he says, we have a man in Dallas, it's Lee Harvey Oswald, he's an ex-Marine, he had defected to Russia, he's pro-communist, he is a, quote, mean-spirited individual in the category of a nut, mm. end quote. Two hours after the shooting, when everybody doesn't even know for sure what happened, uh, because keep in mind, uh, regardless of what the government has said, there is absolutely no unimpeachable witness who actually ever saw Oswald shoot from the window. Okay? Right. And yet, two hours later, uh, Jagger Hoover's got a whole rundown on him and says, we've got our man Dallas, and he's a lone nut, basically. Okay? So... And yet, at that same time, he had just arrived at the Dallas police station, and he had two sets of identification on him. One uh, was, says Lee Harvey Oswald, and the other was the draft card that said Alex James Hydell. And they're saying, well, you know, which one are you? And he's being uncooperative. He said, you're the cops. Figure it out. Right. He now, doesn't admit so, to it. Yeah. Right. So, whoa, wait a minute. But Hoover's got it all nailed down. Doesn't that just smack of uh, pre-arranged evidence and pre-arranged scenario? Yeah, how did he so, know? How did he know? Well, that is fascinating. So take us back into the strange story of what happened at the theater. All right, now back to Oswald's arrest. So okay. once we understand that there's all kinds of things going on here, um, we go look at the arrest and we find that Oswald uh, and the Tippett murder are somehow intertwined. That doesn't mean that Oswald did it, but uh, it's interesting because uh, after he arrived back at his rooming house, the landlady said that moments before Oswald showed up, a police car pulled up out front, and she said she knew some of the boys. And she said, but she looked, and she didn't recognize the car, and she couldn't really remember the number, but she remembered, she thought it had a one and, and maybe a zero. Well, Tippett was in car 10 that day, and, uh -huh. he was, and he was outside of his assigned to beat area, okay? And, uh, in fact, about that time, they were trying to radio him, and he didn't respond. So based on all kinds of information, it seems that Tippett may have driven over to uh, Oswald's rooming house, and uh, right after Oswald had arrived, and then tooted his horn, beep, beep, Okay. Right. The landlady and looks out, doesn't recognize the car, and she sees the car pull on down Beckley Street and then turn right on Zang, and uh, then just moments later, apparent as if on signal or cue, here comes uh, Oswald hustling out of his room. He doesn't say anything. Goes out the front, and she sees him heading to the right down towards Zang. I think I just now this is theorizing. Sure. I think Oswald turned the corner gotten Tippett's police car, and I think Tippett drove Oswald to the Texas Theater for whatever purposes. Um, right. This, this, by the way, explains how Oswald was able to travel about more than a mile from his rooming house up to Jefferson Street and to the, to the Texas Theater, and nobody saw him. I, I can still clearly remember that day, Daniel, and it had rained and was kind of cool in the morning, but by 10 o'clock it had pretty well cleared off, and by noon, and for the rest of the afternoon, it was bright, sunny Indian summer here in Texas, and, and it was a Friday, and, you know, the president was in town, and uh, this is, by the way, uh, from a lot of people pre prior to air conditioning, and so, you know, there would have been people sitting out on the front porch and out in the yard and 
wandering all around. They would have seen him. You know, somebody would have seen him. Somebody would have seen him, and nobody, nobody. They've never come up with anybody who saw Oswald walking, running, trotting, or anything. Well, you, mentioned, those, well, you mentioned other witnesses who saw somebody else, right? Right. The witness they have, Helen Markham, is not credible because she said she bent down and talked to Tippett, and yet the, uh, the medical examiner and the autopsy showed he was, he was uh, hit in the heart, so he was dead before he hit the ground. Uh, yeah. There's other oddities, too. His pistol was out of the holster and lying under his body, uh, and so it's apparently... Uh, uh, well, anyway, so the scenario seems to be that Tippett, after dropping Oswald off at the theater, then pulled Candy Corner across the street to the um, Big Ten record store where he was had a custom of going in to use the telephone because this was the day before cell phones. Right. And uh, he stopped, rushed in there right about 1 o'clock, rushed back, got on the telephone, but apparently was not able to connect to whoever he wanted to connect with, so he rushed back out, not saying anything, which is kind of unusual, because usually he'd stop in, shoot the bull, say, how are you, socialize a little bit, use the phone, okay? And it was at that exact time, that were right at 1 o'clock, that the dispatcher tried to radio him, and he didn't respond. Well, that's because he was out of his car, and he was in the, the record shop. So then he goes, jumps in his car, starts heading west on Jefferson, then turns north uh, and gets to 10th, and then starts heading back east on 10th. And just after passing Patton Street is where his car was stopped in the roadway there, and then they found him. And so, according to all the evidence, apparently he was heading in that direction, which in, may or may not have any pertinence, but that was he was heading right in the direction of Jack Ruby's apartment, which wow. is very close. Very close over there now. Whether it has any connection or not, we don't know. But so he sees somebody walking down the street, and he pulls over. And the, according to some witnesses, they had a conversation with him in the car and the other this, this other person on the sidewalk over there. And yet, uh, the crime scene photos showed the window, the right hand window of the police cars rolled up. So it's kind of weird. It's like how do you have a conversation through a closed window? But, oh, right. But then, and then whatever took place apparently got his suspicions up, and he gets out of the driver's uh, side of the police car and draws his pistol. And as he's walking around the left front fender of the car, whoever is up on the sidewalk there shoots him two or three times, one of them in the heart. He's dead when he hits the ground, and his pistol's lying under his body. So he had actually drawn his pistol, wow. so there was some, something serious going on there. And then what was really not known at the time but was confirmed by the House Select Committee on Assassinations was after he'd been hit two or three times and was on the ground, uh, the killer walks up to him and gives him a coup de grace shot in the head. Shot in the head. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, in other words, this was not a case of someone shooting the cop trying to escape. This was somebody who wanted Tippett dead. Yeah. Okay. And then the, whoever did the shooting took off, and then you got uh, the best witness is T.F. Bowley, uh, who was coming down the street and heard the shots and stopped, and he looked at his watch, and it was about 10 after 1. Okay. And that's probably when it actually happened. Now, the Warren Commission had to uh, had to move uh, that way back to about 120 uh, by citing the uh, the man who, and I think it was Bully, who got on the radio and said, we have an officer shot down here. But if you'll actually read the details, you'll find that a uh, Hispanic fellow named Buenavides actually was the first on the scene and uh, tried to use the... And, of course, he waited. He said he heard the shots, knew something had happened, saw the policeman on the ground. He was quite rightly fearful that the killer might be around and might try to kill him. So he kind of hid and looked for a while and when he couldn't see anybody. Then he finally went up there, and, and then he got in the cop car, and he was trying to use the radio, but he didn't know how to use it. And uh, so you can figure there's anywhere from five and ten minutes uh, floating around there, and then when Bowley shows up, he says, here, let me, and he gets in there, and he uses the radio, and by this time, it's like one sixteen or 18, something like that, I think, okay. maybe almost okay. one twenty, and that has been the time that the Warren Commission used as the, as the time of the shooting, but it's not true. It was actually just shortly after one, and why is that important? Well, because 
if there had ever been a fair trial, I could have produced at that time three separate witnesses that can place Oswald in the theater shortly after one right. at the time. So he couldn't obviously couldn't have been in the theater and shooting Tippett too. Uh, so so the uh, Tippett shooting he, takes place at the same time as he goes into the theater. Yes, actually a little bit afterwards. He was in the theater by right a little after one, one one oh five maybe. Okay, and in fact, Butch Burroughs, the assistant manager of the theater, uh, he uh, he had to really work with him and he had to go over his story over and over and over again. But he finally explained to me that Oswald uh, came in the theater much earlier than the Tippett shooting. In fact, that he had come out and that Butch Burroughs had sold popcorn to him and then watched him go back to a seat. Okay, the, the, another one was Jack Davis, who at that time was an 18-year-old uh, kid who wanted to go see the war movie, okay? Mm-hmm. And so here, now picture this, he's in a th- big old theater that holds 900 people, right. and there's only about, only about 20 people in the whole theater, and they're <laughs> scattered all around. So he's back at the back, over in the right-hand section, uh, about third row down, and a few seats from the aisle just by himself. And here comes this guy, comes in the theater, gets on his row, squeezes past him, and sits in the seat next to him. Wow. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute. And, of course, he's going, wow, what's this? But the guy didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. And a few minutes later, the guy gets up, pushes through it past him again, goes over to the other side, to the central part of the uh, section. So he was trying to meet uh, someone, you think? Trying to meet somebody, and that was Lee Harvey Oswald. Mm. And he said that all this happened just as the time that the show was starting. Well, the show, according to the Butch Burroughs and according to the advertisements, the actual picture started at 110. So in other words, 110, <laughs> Oswald's in the theater. Wow. So that really would exonerate him from the tippet side. Exactly. Yeah. And that, see, this is very important because all these years they've used the argument, well, you know, uh, he shot the cop. Why would he shoot the cop if he hadn't shot the president? Right. Well, let's just turn it around. If he didn't shoot the cop, maybe he didn't shoot the president. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent point. Well, there's something about the shell casings at the scene that's problematic. Right. They don't match. Yeah. There's an officer named J.M. Poe who uh, quite correctly and according to proper police procedures took charge of the 38 shell cases that they said was at the scene, and he scratched his initials in them, Mm -hmm. J.M.P., I believe, okay? Well, then later in the spring, when the Warren Commission got the shell cases out of the National Archives, showed him Poe, he could not find his initials on them. Oh. And, and, and there's there's even more things. For one thing, there were different types of ammo, all right. And and that's and Oswald, by the way, is never known. Nowhere in any of his belongings did they find any Hoppy's number nine gun oil or or greasy rags or or cotton patches or nothing. He had no gun cleaning equipment. Or no accessories. You know, nothing. No accessories whatsoever. And uh, and then there's this one, too. And you have to really understand your firearms. But okay. what Oswald had was a 38 Special. Now, a 38 Special had originally been a regular 38 uh, revolver, okay? Uh-huh. Uh, but when you do, to make the Special, what they did was they had to change out the cylinder uh, so it would accommodate a 38 bullet that was slightly... Uh, slightly longer than the regular 38, and that makes, that's why it's got a little more powder in it, so it's a little more powerful. Right. And they call this the 38 Special, okay? So, uh, and, and they rechamber the gun to accept this. The point is, is that when you fire a 38 Special round to uh, or uh, 38 through this 38 Special chamber. The, it's a little bit smaller in diameter than the cylinder, and it, so the bullet casing expands and bulges gotcha. quite noticeably, okay? Yeah. Kind of, I, you might picture a, a pregnant bullet. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. yeah. All right. 
And so this is what happens, uh, and this has been tested and tested uh, with a 38 pistol, special pistol. And yet the shell casings that are in the National Archives show no bulge. In other words, they were not fired through that pistol that All they right. say belonged to Oswald. And then there's another thing about the pistol, which is that uh, Officer McDonald, who was the first cop on the to reach Oswald in the theater. Yeah. And uh, I think part of the problem there was he was not in on the on the plan. And I think the plan was because we know there were cops waiting in the alley out back. And then when they came in with uh, Johnny Brewer, they went up on the stage and turned the house lights up but kept the movie going. And they're going, okay, where's the guy? And Brewer sees Oswald back towards the back and kind of points at him and says, I think that's him. All right, now you'd think that the cops would rush back to get this guy, right? right. No. They start working their way back. I'll dial, sir, stand up, let's see some ID. They're giving him every opportunity to try to make a run for it for the back door uh, where there were cops waiting back there, and I think the plan was to kill him trying to escape. I got it. And then it's all wrapped up, see. But uh, McDonald got to him first. And uh, he, according to him, and this was, uh, he told this whole story to the Associated Press, which ran in the newspapers the very next day. And he said he got there and Oswald stood up and said, well, it's all over now or something like that. Right. And, and pulled this pistol from his belt and jammed it into uh, McDonald's belly. And he said he heard the gun snap. And he thought, damn or my lucky it didn't go off. You know? <laughs> right. And so now in the Warren report. So the gun doesn't even fire. <laughs> so the gun didn't work. Right. Now buried in the Warren volumes is the FBI notice that said they had to, that the firing pin on that pistol was bent and that uh, they had to repair it before they could test it for ballistics. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> now, that's another thing. See, again, let's, let's assume the plan was to get rid of Oswald. Yeah. So they, they, they killed the cop. Now, now he's a cop killer. You know, shoot on, shoot on sight. They give him, give him a gun with a bent firing pin so they know he can't shoot back. Right. And so he's just going to be killed by the police, I yeah, think. Okay. But it doesn't go off. But McDonald clearly heard it snap and doesn't make any mention of anything else. Now, uh, come the Warren Commission report, I think somebody realized that, you know, that there's a problem with this. So they said police are trained to stick their uh, thumb in between the hammer and the gun, you know, or, or that, you know, that thin piece of skin between yeah. your thumb and your hand, you know. Right. You jam that down in there, and then the hammer hits that, and... Uh, you don't get shot. And oh, they're like trained that. to do that, it says. <laughs> and they and the way they wrote it, the way they leave the impression that this is what happened. But they don't say that's what happened. They just say police are trained to do this and leave the impression that that's what happened. But I guarantee you, that didn't happen. Yeah. Because if the hammer on a pistol, if that clamps in there between your thumb and hand, believe me, you're going to know it. You're going to scream bloody murder because <laughs> it's going to hurt like hell. It's going to bleed. You know, and McDonald's didn't never mention anything like that, so it didn't happen. So the so they 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 screwed with the with the idea of putting the thumb between the hammer and the gun and put it out there as if that had happened to try to deflect attention from the fact that the pistol didn't work. Oh wow! Okay, well if it didn't work in the theater, how could he have shot Tippett a few minutes earlier? Right. So yeah. see, all this stuff is just nuts, yeah. man, once you really begin to look at it. And then, of course, we have two, I've got two, well, actually two arrest reports and a, another report from out of Dallas police files that clearly state the suspect was arrested in the balcony of the Texas theater. Well, we all know, actually, he was arrested at the, in the main floor in the center section, third row, third seat, okay? Well, that's and, weird. And uh, hauled yeah. out the front. There's photographs of them bringing Oswald out the front of the theater. And yet I also interviewed Bernard uh, uh, Hare, who had a hobby store just a few doors down from the theater, right. heard all the hubbub, went out there, was standing at the back of the crowd. In fact, I found him in a picture of the crowd outside the Texas Theater, and he's over there at the, on the edge of the crowd. Well, that verifies and, he was there. Yeah, I verified he was there. And he said... Uh, 
he said there was a hubbub going on, but he got there and he was the back of the crowd and he couldn't really see what was going on. So he went back through his store and went back into the alleyway, and he said there were police cars all lined up and down in the alley back there, and that as he turned and walked a few steps towards the uh, Texas School Book uh, Theater, uh, the door back door slammed open, and some cops came out dragging a young white guy who looked kind of disheveled as if he'd been in some kind of scuffle or fight, uh -huh. and they threw him in the back of a squad car, and they took off down the alley and made a right and headed towards town in the police station. And, I, and up until the time that I went and interviewed Bernard Hare, he thought he had witnessed the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. And when I showed him the pictures of Oswald coming out to being dragged out the front of the theater, he said, well, who did I see? And that's the $64,000. Uh, that's so unusual. Oh, the whole thing just stinks to high heaven. So yeah. Well, you've got some kind of an impersonator there or they're, they're grabbing right. somebody else uh, right. Right, at, right at the theater though. Right. Yeah. Well, I think the whole idea was they they planted Oswald in the theater, told him to go meet somebody, and then they used this duplicate to lure the authorities to the theater, and then they hustled this guy out and probably said, oh, he's with us, and they hustled him out of there. In fact, if you want to know what happened to the lookalike, uh, get a hold of James Douglas's book, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable. Yeah, it's excellent. And in there, he tells the story of Robert Vinson, who was a military guy who happened to catch a ride, I think, out of Washington and was trying to get back to his home unit. So he just happened to hook a ride on a military uh, plane, and then all of a sudden they were diverted to Dallas. He recognized it was Dallas from the skyline, and they landed <laughs> near the Trinity River, and they picked up three men on the afternoon of the 22nd, flew them to the uh, air base at Roswell, New Mexico. Right. And, and he, he swore up and down. He tried to strike up a conversation with these guys, and they wouldn't talk to him. But he said one of them was Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, this guy's story is unreal and underreported. Uh, let's go to a clip of him talking about this unusual plane ride on November 22nd, 1963, and coming face-to-face -face with this Oswald doppelganger. Then there was a cargo plane, which I had seen before, and uh, it had, but the tail, tail was a little bit different than what I had, was used to. And it had a, a marking on it it uh, looked like a, a, a world, the picture of a world, without uh, the, all the different uh, drawings, just plain. And then it had uh, longitude and latitude uh, white marks around it. Normally, most of the aircraft had USAF written on the tail. This one did not. Describe the area where this plane landed, the C-54. It was south of Dallas along the uh, Trinity River. We were on the south side of the Trinity River when we landed because there was trees and water back to the north of us. And then there was two gentlemen got on the airplane. Um, one of them was uh, oh about six foot, six foot two, weighed about I imagine 200 or around 190, 200 pounds. Uh, he was wearing uh, white, well, it was a beige-like coveralls. And uh, there was another gentleman, him, he was much shorter. And he had uh, black hair, kind of skinny. And I guess he would weigh approximately uh, maybe 150, 155 pounds. All right, were these Caucasians? Uh, one of them uh, looked like he was a uh, Latin, maybe Cuban, and the other one was Caucasian. Well, it looked like where we had landed was a road under construction. Yeah. And the Jeep was back up, oh, maybe about 20 or 30 feet from the door when they got out. All right. And then they walked on up and got in. Jeep turned around and took off. The Jeep uh, uh, was a yellow type. Looked like a road Jeep. Uh, they used on roads, you know, for repairing them, yellow. It and was kind of yellowish color. Uh, after seeing his picture on television an awful lot, uh, a person that looked like him, and he looked, this person that got on the airplane looked an awful lot like uh, Oswald. Well, we turned around and took off, 
and were headed west. They went on up behind the cockpit and sat down, and uh, they, no one spoke to me, not even the pilot or I might have been a navigator, I don't know, but... Now, where did the C-54 go? We went to, I later found out, a place called Roswell Air Force Base in New Mexico. Jim, that sounds like a very sophisticated covert operation. Now, see, none of this makes sense when you try to think of it in terms of a low-level plot. Yeah. Oswald, a few friends, some KGB agents, a few uh, loose cannon CIA guys or mafia hitmen. It doesn't seem to make any sense, but when you understand that the assassination in November of 1963 was a palace revolt, it was a true coup d'etat yeah. involving elements of the military, the FBI, the CIA, the mafia, you know, and see, they've kept us off balance for years going, is it one of those? Which one of those is it? Well, the answer is all of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and where were they all collectively together and operating? Uh, under Operation Mongoose, which was the secret war against Castro in this Mongoose program uh, that included assassination capability uh, were anti-Castro Cubans, FBI agents, CIA people, mafia people, you know, hello. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. They, they just sent their hit team. They, they had decided that, uh, you know, they were kind of uh, spitting in the wind uh, trying to get Castro when the real problem was in the White House. Uh, well, if we look at intelligence operations where they create a double for some reason, uh, what impression were they trying to create here? Well, and of course, then you get into the whole weird idea of multiple Oswalds, yeah. okay? And uh, you really, if you can get hold of a copy of John Armstrong's self-published book, Harvey and Lee, he just does a masterful job of doing what all the investigations fail to do, and that is truly following up uh, and looking into Oswald's background. And what he just proves beyond any question is that uh, from time to time Oswald was impersonated. Okay, people yeah. run around claiming to be Oswald, only weren't Oswald. Right. And and if that sounds strange to you, Daniel, just keep in mind there is a document uh, from. Uh, the summer of 1960, three years before the assassination, signed by it's a memo from J. Edgar Hoover to the Security Division of the State Department, warning that an imposter might be using Lee Harvey Oswald's birth certificate, and he he wanted to have any information that the uh, state may have on this guy. That's so well, odd. Wait yeah. a minute. Now, well, wait a minute. We were told that nobody in the federal government knew anything at all about Oswald, and now we find that J. Edgar Hoover personally was aware of Lee Harvey Oswald uh, three years before the assassination and in the context of believing that someone was impersonating him. That's amazing. It is. And, well, here, now, Daniel, what's amazing to me is not so much that. This is stuff that's leaked out over the years, okay? So it is not so surprising that nobody at that time knew about that. Uh, what's surprising to me is that where's the news media? How come we don't know these things? How come it hadn't been on the front page of every newspaper? Right. You know, that is, that to me just evidence is just is incredible control over the news media of this country. And so there's, there's a news there blackout on it. Yeah, and I know it's there because I've been in the news business since the 50s and I've seen it in action, okay? <laughs> Well, you're saying that with Oswald, well, what they were up to was building the perfect patsy with the help of these doubles. Yeah. Well, in fact, actually, you know, in the in intelligence parlance, they call that building a legend. And there was a legend. I had an old, uh, old uh, military intelligence agent that I worked with for a number of years. He's passed on now. Uh, and the worst thing I can say about him is, is he told me stuff that I just simply could not prove one way or another but a whole lot of what he told me turned out to be documented fact yeah so and i i tend i think he's telling the truth well years and years ago he told me he said you know he said at one point in time there was many as six lee harvey oswalds running around wow. and and I, I, back then when he told me that i'm going what wait, wait, what are you talking about <laughs> And now I begin to see what he's talking about, and yeah. I think that very well could be true. I think they created this legend that was Lee Harvey Oswald. And actually, in actuality, it was a combination of people. 
Well, it's interesting if we stay with this look-alike theme. Uh, even on the day of the shooting, they had a kind of Oswald double named Billy Lovelady, who was working not only in the Texas School Book Depository, but on the same sixth floor with Oswald. Right. And right. you've pointed out this photo that looks like Oswald on the front steps, but was supposed to uh -huh. be Lovelady, right. they say. Uh, so we have obfuscation of the trail right there at the scene. Oh, I think they had several... Uh contingencies and ready to go. I, you know, keep in mind that Wesley Frazier, who drove Oswald, they said drove Oswald to work that day, he could have easily been arrested as an accomplice. So they certainly had the pressure on him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I know somebody who knew Billy Lovelady personally, and there's just some weird stuff going on with that. He's, he almost tried to tell her some stuff. The thing is on the lookalike, what appears to have happened is simply this. Well, I'll never forget that Marguerite Oswald told me one time, and this kind of blew me away, that uh, when Lee was in junior high school, he, he came home one afternoon after school with a military officer. And this officer was telling Mrs. Oswald, oh, yeah, yeah, your son's great. He's a, he's a lot, kind of a loner, but he's smart, and he's a self-motivated and self-starter and you know, he's a, he's the very, very type of guy we need, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, you, there's the case that he tried to join the Marines when he was 16, he even forged a letter from his mother saying he was older, but he got caught, and they, they turned him out, sent him back home. And Marguerite said for the whole next year, uh, what, all he did was study his brother's Marine Corps manual. Now, does this sound like an anti-American, pro-communist? No. Definitely not. And I, so, so Lee gets in the military, okay, and he's gung-ho. They've already tagged him because I have reason to believe his brother Robert was CIA, okay? Okay. So, and plus the story of the military officer coming home after school. So they, even at this young age, the military had already tagged Oswald as a potential uh, intelligence operative. Okay, so he gets in the, Marine, in the Marine Corps. At the same time, now, all the same time, there's a kid in New York, grew up in New York, um, and probably uh, was the offspring of an uh, immigrant family from the Baltic region because when he was in Russia, several people said he had a Baltic accent. Uh -huh. You know, well, why would Oswald, who's learned Russian out of a book, supposedly, came from Texas, Louisiana, why would he have a Baltic accent? Right. But he, so anyway, though, so in New York, and then this is what Armstrong can prove to you, is that there are school records showing that Oswald was in school in New York. At the very same time, it shows he was in school in New Orleans. So right. I think they were actually grooming these two kids. Now, the, the idea being that the New York Oswald, who we'll call Harvey, okay? okay. Harvey uh, was, as I said, came from an immigrant family, and they were probably virulently anti-communist. So he's a perfect guy, and he can speak Russian fluently. And so he's the perfect guy that they want to send to Russia as a spy. Right. But they can't seem, to, can't seem to Russia under his own... I didn't even the Russians say, well, that comes from that family, and that they're anti-communist, this guy's a spy. So what they did was they found somebody that looked a whole lot like him, and they landed on Lee Harvey Oswald. So uh -huh. Lee, and so then in the Marines, they put them both in the Marines at the same time, and then it was Harvey who went to Russia under the name Lee Harvey Oswald, prompting J. Edgar Hoover's memo that an imposter was using his birth certificate. Okay, so someone's okay. imitating him there. Exactly. And then, in fact, I think the Harvey that went to Russia impersonating Oswald is the same fellow who was killed by Jack Ruby in Dallas. Okay. Now, this also explains why his wife, Marina, and why Judith Mary Baker, who says she was his girlfriend in yeah. New Orleans, yeah. and, you know, why they haven't said, oh, yeah, that was not the real guy, because this was the only guy they ever knew. Yeah. Okay? But now, if you go read the Warren Commission testimony of his brother Robert and his uh, stepbrother uh, Echdel, uh -huh. and, then, and his mother, and they all commented about how changed he was when he came back from Russia. Yes. That's because he was similar, but he wasn't the same guy. Well, they said his hair had changed, it had thinned out, yeah. Yeah. and that his skin tone seemed different. 
Right. The one I the one I liked was I think it was his brother talked about how he had a had a big thick neck and now so he's got a little scrawny neck. <laughs> you know, your neck doesn't change that much. <laughs> but the historical Oswald did live in New York when he was younger, also, right? Yes. So yeah, they sent him up there for a brief period of time. Right. It was they were only there a very short time. So we know right. that there there was a real Oswald there. This historical oh, yeah. Oswald. So yeah. this this other Oswald that Armstrong has drawn a trail on, uh, he basically is somebody who looked exactly like Oswald. Obviously, they had to have incredible yeah. similarity. Everybody's got a doppelganger somewhere. And when you think about the time frames involved, like when he left to go to the Marines, he was 17, uh, I guess. And, uh, and then nobody saw him. Uh, for a couple of years until he's like 20, 21, and then only briefly. Well, think how much you changed during those years. Sure. Uh, my my uh, school pictures when I was in, say, uh, the uh, 10th grade uh, versus my college picture just seems like a whole different guy, you know. Well, one of the fascinating viewpoints on this was Fletcher Prouty, who did great work on the JFK case and uh -huh. worked in intelligence. But he said that Oswald's background appeared to be manipulated so that the paper trail would be obscured. Right. Uh, so this idea of him showing up in two places at once, for example, right. the people he met would never know which one they were dealing with exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's what helped confuse the thing. And see, that's what made Oswald the perfect patsy because they could go back and cherry pick this background information and create a persona of anybody they wanted to. Yeah. Well, you did an amazing video years ago now on the backyard photos and how they had been faked. Uh -huh. uh, the thing I wanted to ask you on this, and I, I believe they are fakes from looking at them, but why does Marina Oswald go on the record saying that she took them? What do you think is going on there? Uh, I think what's going on there is simply this. I think that at some point, uh, she did go in the backyard, and she did take some photographs. It, it's simply the fact that it was not those photographs. I think in recent years, she herself has said, well, yeah, I took some photographs in the backyard, but not those photographs. Okay. Uh, because she remembered standing by the stairway and taking photographs. Well, you know, in the photograph, the stairway is to the side and behind Oswald. So, see, it's just, it wasn't the same one. But then you got to understand that at the time of the assassination, she could barely speak English, and she was scared to death they were going to deport her and her children right. back to Russia. So she uh, was in a situation where she pretty well told the authorities anything they wanted to hear. Uh, another key thing is is that you read her Warren Commission testimony in regard to the backyard photographs, and she starts off saying she just took this one photograph. And then when it was pointed out that there were two photographs, she changed her testimony and said, oh, well, that's right, I took two. Hmm. Well, now we know there were at least three right. because another one popped up 15 years later. So, see, she, she just doesn't really know. Now, you interviewed the people at the photo processing lab at some point. Yes. And what did they tell you? Well, they said that Friday night they were processing all these photographs and films and stuff for the FBI and for the government, and that uh, they both, uh, Pat Hester and her husband, Robert, uh, definitely recall that they were processing pictures of that backyard with the stairway and no figure in it, and they even said they saw uh, that same uh, picture in color. And so, in other words, they were messing with this before it was, and yet, according to the official record, it was those photographs were only found the next day. So, see, there's just a lot of uh, fabrication going on, a lot of deceit. Well, you interviewed Paul Grudy. Yeah, numerous times. Paul and I actually were pretty good friends because, see, back when I was police reporter for the Star Telegram, uh, and he was in charge of the uh, ambulance service. Back then, the funeral homes were the ones that had uh, station wagons, I guess, is kind of what they were. Yeah. But they doubled, and they would transport bodies, but then they also doubled as ambulances. And what they did was they would contract with the city 
uh, to provide the ambulance service for wreck victims, et cetera, et cetera. Uh-huh. So Miller Funeral Home, for a time there, had the city contract, and they were the ambulance service. And so at the time I was police reporter, of course, every time I want to know about an accident victim or murder or, you know, whatever's going on, uh, you know, I could always go and deal with Paul Rudy. So I knew him for a number of years. So you knew him very well. Yeah. And I knew him to be a truthful and truthful guy. What did he tell you about Oswald's corpse? He told me that, well, he told me about, that the FBI had showed up with a crime lab kit on that Monday while he was trying to prepare Oswald's body for burial. I, I said... <laughs> I just said, well, were you, you know, because I'd already figured out, I thought what had happened. So I just went ahead and sprang it on him. I said, were you there when the uh, FBI put his dead hand on that rifle? (laughs) And and without hesitation, he goes, yeah. He said, in fact, I had a hard time getting that black fingerprint ink off Oswald's dead hand in time for the burial later that afternoon. So So, they they went back and palm printed him and fingerprinted him so they could... That's a very unusual. Well, he, he was already fingerprinted, I think, twice, yeah. maybe three times while in police custody. So why would why they this? need to go to the funeral home? Well, because it was only after that incident that uh, on that Monday night following the assassination that Henry Wade almost offhandedly mentioned at a press conference, he says, oh, by the way, have I mentioned we got his fingerprints on the rifle? Well, it turned out there were no fingerprints, but they claimed that they got a fuzzy palm print off the underside of the disassembled barrel, which they said, well, it was just missed early on, you know. Oh. And I have, because I have a letter from Jagger Hoover yeah. the day after where they said that there were no usable fingerprints on the rifle, the clip, or even the inner parts of the rifle. That's been a big problem for them, I would say, because it, it goes against the credibility of the whole lone nut thing if they don't have fingerprints on there. Exactly. Um, but Grudy told you also, we're going back into this to Oswald's thing, that they did an autopsy on Oswald, and later there was they exhumed the body in the early 80s. So yeah. can you get into that a little bit? Because that's fascinating. Oh, it is fascinating. Uh, because, of, But you had to kind of have lived through it, because just describing it, it sounds like, oh, well, you know, they... They uh, said uh, they're going to dig him up, and they had a little bit of a squabble, but then they dug him up, and then the medical examiner declared, no, this is the body of Lee Harvey Oswald, and that was what was all in the headlines, and there, case closed. Yeah. Uh, But it wasn't that simple, okay? First off, I dealt with Linda Norton, the assistant medical examiner over in Dallas who was in charge of that whole thing, and and early on, she was really fired up. She said she had seen enough evidence to convince her that there were certainly serious questions there. And she said, we're going to get to the bottom of it, okay? Okay. And then later, all of a sudden, she got real mute. And <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, years went by before they finally issued a report. But anyway, to begin with, the whole issue of Oswald's identity came up uh, actually back in the uh, 70s with a British author named Michael Eddowes. Okay. Uh, who wrote a book, and in there he postulated that the Russians had substituted someone for Oswald yeah. and had sent back this ringer for the express purpose of killing Kennedy. Of course, he never quite explained how that uh, <laughs> Oswald left the Soviet Union came back over here long before Kennedy was even nominated, much less elected for president. Right. And that was kind of a surprise and a shock to most people because they figured the 60 election was going to be between Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon. Right. So it's like, wait a minute. But he did make a lot of good points by pointing out that uh, scars did not match, heights did not match. For example, Oswald and the Marines on several occasions they gave his height as 5'11", all right? Yeah. And yet at his, at his autopsy, he said he was 5'9". Well, I always thought the Marine Corps built men, <laughs> not right. pulling down well, That's inches. a pretty big jump down, two inches. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, and in fact, I have a news clipping from 1969, I guess it was. Uh, it, I think it only appeared in the Star-Telegram because that's where Marguerite was. And Marguerite, his mother, was asking to have the body exhumed, said she had questions about the marks and um, and Uh stuff on the body. Oh, I didn't know that. So even his own mother was questioning it, okay? So Eddowes brought up this whole thing of exhumation. And uh, 
he even went to court, wanted to get an exclamation order, and they pretty well quickly turned him down and said he was, number one, he wasn't even a U.S. citizen, he had no standing. So time goes by, he goes and gets with Marina Oswald, Lee's wife, okay? okay? So she joins in. Yeah, a little exclamation. Well, she knew something was up, right? Obviously, yeah. she certainly didn't oppose it, <laughs> and uh, and so the Dallas authorities were kind of gradually going, well, okay, but then it turned out that Oswald actually was buried in uh, the Rose Hill Cemetery, which is in Tarrant County, okay, next to Dallas, and the Tarrant County district attorney, who at that time was Tim Curry, he starts dragging his feet and says, no, blah, blah, blah. Well, they kept squabbling over that, and more time went by. And then finally, they kind of, apparently they kind of got past him. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, they said, okay, and they ordered the explanation. And then the next thing you know, Lee's brother Robert steps in with a restraining order, saying, no, don't do that. I don't want you doing that, blah, blah, blah. That's weird. And, and, and what kind of sense does this make? Yeah. If they dig up Oswald and it's just Oswald, then what's changed? Right. Nothing. They dig up Oswald, and it's not the real Lee Aubrey Oswald. Then his brother's exonerated. Yeah. So see, that never made any sense to me. Absolutely. But it, again, through another log jam in this whole procedure, and then so finally, we now we get into eighty, uh, eighty-one, and Marguerite dies of cancer, and she has the plot next to him at Rose Hill, and so they put up a canopy there, you know for several weeks <laughs> while they, in early 80, when they uh, were digging her grave. Oh, that's right course, next that, to Oswald's. Yeah, so that gives them every opportunity to go down there and then go, si- to go sideways. They have access, to, yeah. They have access, exactly. And so then, uh, that was in like February or so, then it finally gets to be the summer, about August or so, and all of a sudden all the opposition and foot dragging to this exhumation suddenly dissipates. It just, well, okay. And Robert goes, oh, I can't fight it more. Go on. All right. So uh, I went and interviewed the, uh, at the time, I interviewed the backhoe operator uh, uh, who was digging down to get to the grave. And he said that, uh, and also Grudy and others said, that uh, Oswald should have been in the same shape he was when they buried him because uh, Baumgartner, uh, who's the other funeral home director, and Grudy, uh-huh. uh, both knew the importance of who they were burying, you know, so they kind of extra embalmed him uh, and then put him in a, uh airtight sealed coffin, which was then placed into a airtight sealed concrete vault, okay, at the mm. cemetery. And so this is what they were going to dig up. Well, the backhoe operator... Uh, told me that when they dug down there, they found that the concrete uh, container had been broken uh, and was in pieces, and that the coffin had been broken into, the seal broken, and that air, water had gotten in, and so the body had decomposed considerably. Uh, and they said that was, you know, not impossible, but very unlikely. You know, they, so someone got all, into it. Somebody got into it. Okay. Mm. So then Baumgartner and, uh, and Grudy, uh, Marina Oswald, who had arranged for this whole exhumation anyway, uh, at the last minute said, I, we want you guys along because you were the last people to handle the body. We want you to identify the visceral bag and rings and things like that. Okay. And so they went to, I think it was Southwest Medical School. And um, sometime later, some months later, Grudy was telling me that while they were there, and they checked, and sure enough, the visco bag looked like it was okay, and they found the wedding ring or I don't know things, and 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 he said, but they they had the the head, the skull, which was mostly just a skull with just a little bit of decomposed flesh on it and some hair, right. and, and uh, said said it was really odd. They both looked at each other at the time because they just reached in there and they just pulled the head out, you know. Well, wait a minute, your head's connected to your body with a very stout, you know, spinal column. And so they thought that was kind of odd. But the key thing was is that they put the head on a tray, had it sitting on the floor, and uh, Paul Grudy said he accidentally bumped it with his foot and he kind of rolled a little bit. And that's when he began to notice that there was no sign of a craniotomy 
on uh, this skull. Uh. Now, the craniotomy is where they make kind of a broad V-shaped cut uh, on your head, and then they pull reflect back the scalp to get to the skull, and then they cut this V shape cut and they can just lift the top of the skull off and that way it allows them to get to the brain and so um, at the autopsy of Oswald uh, by Earl Rose they had performed a craniotomy, craniotomy where they take the top of the head off and and, and, and as Paul Grudy explained to me when you put the, the skull cap back on you can set it right back on there but it's never going to go back together, okay? Right. It's like cutting a two-by-four in half, and you can put the two ends back together, but they're never going to be one. Right, they won't know? be, yeah. There's no, they're and not going to so, be seamless. Exactly. And so uh, both Baumgartner and Grudy said that uh, there was no sign of this craniotomy. And then, strangely enough, uh, they were supposed to have three sets of dental records on Oswald. Yeah. One when he first entered the Marine Corps, and then another while he was in, and then a, another examination when he got out. And they were going to, the government was supposed to hand over all three, and they were going to compare all this to the corpse and uh, see if that matches. Well, it turns out the government only gave them one set <laughs> of teeth. And this one, there were discrepancies, but there was enough similarities that they said, well, okay, this is Oswald. But well, then they had the problem with the craniotomy. And uh, that's why I think they wrestled with that for a long time and applied pressure wherever they could. And because it was like two years or more before they ever finally issued a report on this uh, on this uh, grave uh, exhumation. Well, Grudy, Grudy would have known. He, he was the one who, uh, you know, prepared exactly. the body in the first place. So he's, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't and get any said, better than that. So basically what they were saying was is that that was not the same skull. Well, that is fascinating. Uh, let's go now to a clip of Grudy describing how the head that he had prepared for burial was different than the one they dug up at the exhumation of Lee Harvey Oswald. Of course, I was uh, the one that uh, had to handle the body in the morgue at Baylor. And uh, as we removed the body from the casket, or uh, at least... Uh, worked with the body, I could recognize that uh, uh, this clothing was the clothing that I had put on that body. And yet, when I saw the head of this body, uh, and it was removed from the casket and removed from the body in order that they might x-ray it and take pictures, um, I could see that there was no autopsy on that head. When a, an autopsy is done and the skull is... Uh, cut in order to remove the cap, uh, in order to remove the brain, there is a distinctive line of where all the fissures and all of the skull has been parted. Now, it's going to cause a bit of a, of a mark. Uh, no matter what you try and do, it's going to show. And uh, knowing that I handled the body originally, and there was an autopsy on that head, and now to see that there was no autopsy on the head, made it in my mind pretty clear that something had transpired that had caused this and uh, I feel as though someone had gone to the cemetery uh, off hours had uh, taken a uh, the head of really of Lee Harvey Oswald that now was dead uh, how he got that way I don't know but at least it was the head and uh, had brought the vault to the surface as best they could, being a, a heavy item as it is, a tripod, uh, lifting that uh, body, uh, lifting the body and the vault out of the grave. In the process, the bottom of the vault fell, uh, breaking the vault, uh, causing the casket to, to deteriorate to a degree. Uh, then, of course, uh, removed the head of the one that was there that had been autopsied and put this head in its place so that we would find the teeth of Lee Harvey Oswald. That's my theory. This is what I think happened. Um, there's a story about, you mentioned this in the new version of Crossfire, um, which is fantastic, by the way. Love that new Thank edition. You. And uh, But it's about the video photographer guy, Hall, I think. It's yeah. Nice. Yeah. Now, what is that? Yeah, that's about? an odd one, too. Yeah. Well, and you know what? I, I should have checked on that. It seems like I tried to, but I... Marina's getting hard to get hold of. She's yeah. she's not Porter anymore, and 
Uh, anyway, I, I maybe I should have pressed harder on that, but to the best of my knowledge, I don't think she ever got those videos back. Wow. Which is which is unconscionable because she's the one that paid for them. Exactly. They are her. So see, that's just there's there's almost not any issue, no matter how small, in this whole thing that that can't be thrown into a contest. It's, it's amazing. It's really being obscured on purpose. Um, Absolutely. So, but this guy Hall, the way you wrote it, and this is very interesting, that Marina basically hired him to videotape the entire process of the exhumation and then the autopsy afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then um, she had the film, and questions came up later because of what Grudy said about... No, he, she never got the film. He had the film. Oh, okay. And then when the questions came up, she said, well, you know, everybody was saying Jack White and Grudy and all these others that were all involved in this, they said, well, if we can just get hold of the videotape, mm-hmm. that should show one way or another. You know, either right. the skull's intact or it's not. But they could never get hold of it. Hmm. And by this time, Hall said, oh, no, I took that. It's mine. <laughs> and he refused to give it up. In fact, they, she took him to court. And I think the court ordered that he hand it over, except as far as I can, I, I haven't been able to find anywhere where it says that actually took place. Wow. Hey, maybe you can get hold of Hall and find out, does he still have it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's a very, very unusual part of that story, I have to say, because... Uh, Grudy just being so um, credible and, you know, he would know. And then the fact that there is this piece of film out there that could confirm what he saw or right. not, you know. Now, here's another little thing that's not going to get written down because you'll never <laughs> prove this. But this is the kind of crap I have to live with. Things you know, <laughs> you know, but you can't prove. Kind of like the letter, you know, warning Kenny was going to be killed from A.J. Heidel to the Dallas fleet. Yeah. You know, and uh, this and Heidel was, uh, is the name that... Oswald used. It was like his yeah, second exactly. Name, right. Exactly. Uh, so Jack White, who was following this exhumation thing quite closely at the time, uh, told me this story that he had uh, uh, gotten uh, in, uh, gotten emails, I guess, from um, this pr- college professor in East Texas, who apparently had some interest in the Kennedy assassination, and was asking him very pointed questions, and just said, you know, were there any uh, questionable thing going on about the autopsy, and Jack White responded, "Yes, we do have a, a couple of real big questions." And the guy wrote back and said, "Is it about the craniotomy?" So it's like he was aware of it, <laughs> wow. which was pretty, which was pretty wild because yeah. uh, Jack only knew about it from talking to Paul Grudy, and Paul Grudy and Alan Baumgartner were the only ones who actually knew about this issue and, and certainly had any knowledge of the whole thing. So Jack got real curious and started then corresponding with this professor, and it, it gets weirder. It turns out the professor had just recently joined as a teacher. Before that, he had been an officer in the Air Force, uh. and that he had been uh, sent to Carswell. Oh, God, I can't I mean, hardly remember the story now. But uh, he, he went to Carswell and oversaw a flight that came in, and it had something to do with the Oswald exclamation. And it's like, wait a minute, what the heck is that all about? And so it's, I think he somehow knew that they brought in a new head. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that, they, that they were going to put in the grave so that it would match up with the Oswald dental records. That is so unusual. Yeah, the whole thing's just... just um, well, that's fascinating. The uh, you Well, you call those tidbits, right? That's one of your yeah. things about it. Yeah, but little tidbits. You've spent the time on this case. This thing about the tramps, uh, What what's your opinion of what was going on there? Well, that's another odd one, but I'll tell you, the uh, when you compare the tall tramp... Yeah. And you see the ear, you see the jawline, you see the unusual wrinkle that runs around his neck. I'm pretty convinced that that tall track is Charles Harrelson. Charles Harrelson, who's a who who was convicted of murder. Convicted hitman, yeah, yeah. of Judge Wood. Okay, and there's other stuff that incriminates him. He confessed to the Kennedy assassination when he was high on cocaine and was holding off the police out at Van Horn, Texas. Oh, he did. Uh, and then he told. Uh, 
Chuck Cook, I believe it was, a reporter for the Dallas News. He says, I can't talk to you here in the jail because my cell's bugged. And then a few months later, it turned out that it came out that they were bugging his cell. Oh, he knew. He's telling the truth there. He says, but he says, if I ever get out of here, I'll give you the biggest story you ever got. <laughs> and he Chuck said, what's that? He said, November the 22nd, 1963. You remember that. So I think there's ever reason to believe the tall tramp was Charles Holson, and we got a fairly good idea on who the other two were. But, of course, this flies directly in the face of these police reports, which suddenly turned up in the same handwriting, you know, in the Dallas police files after, you know, almost 40 years Yeah. Uh, that said that it's these three tramps. And then one of them was already dead, but they found the other two, and, they, and basically they're saying, yeah, I was in Dallas, and yeah, I got arrested, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so everybody just said, well, there, it took care of that. Well, okay, my take is, is that I think the Gadney and whoever the other guy is, uh, the two tramps mm-hmm. that they identified, I, I'm, not, I'm willing to accept their story at face value. Okay, they were there. They did get arrested in Dallas, and they did clean up, and they did, were sent on their way. That still doesn't explain the lack of paperwork and arrest records that was missing for 40 years. Right. And I think that they were, uh, this happened at a different time, okay? So, yes, it happened, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the same tramps that they pulled out of the railroad car. Well, tell tell us about how weird it was the way they took them out of the car and how they weren't really even arresting them. They were sort of escorting them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> those pictures exactly. are unusual, and I agree with you that those are the strangest pictures because they don't look like they're doing police work. That's right. It looks like they're all just kind of sauntering on back somewhere. Uh, well, the, the basic story is is that uh, not too long after the assassination, and that's another thing, the time frames have been jiggled with so much that you can't say with any certainty when all this happened, but it, it, it had to, I would think it had to be within half hour or, or an hour at the most after the shooting. And Lee Bowers, who was in this railroad tower, who is another object of, of attention oh, yeah. uh, and, and has a whole weird story to go with him. He, he was killed men, shortly after. Oh, well, that's, yeah. you know, that okay. seems to be the general idea. <laughs> right. uh, his, it was a strange one-car accident with no autopsy, and, and, uh, and his body was cremated, even though the family said, well, we didn't order that, so, you know. You did yeah, a fascinating uh, special on the Travel Channel that I saw. Yeah, that yeah, was... they dealt with that pretty well. And one of one of the better one of the better instances of reporting. So anyway, he saw these three guys sneaking in a boxcar on the railroad tracks back there, and he's the one who notified the police. And they went over there and rousted these guys out of the car, and then marched them caddy corner through. Dealey Plaza, and as you said, it marched them back over to the sheriff's office, and uh, this would have been a city offense, so they should have sent them on up to the Dallas police station, Uh and yet, at the time, there was no pre-arrest reports, no reports of these guys being taken in at all, and within a day or two, they're out, they're gone, and uh, it was only the assassination conspiracy researchers who were going, wait a minute, who are these guys? And, of course, you're probably well aware of some of this stuff. It even gets stranger because Colonel Prouty, right. along with another military officer, has ID'd uh, the, uh, General uh, Lansdale, who was in charge of Operation Mongoose, uh, walking past them in Dealey Plaza. Well, Pr- <laughs> Prouty worked with, yeah, he worked with Lansdale, so he knew him yeah. very well. Yeah. So knew for him, him to say well. it, it's like, you know, that's for you saying, well, you know, I've worked with this guy for years and I recognize him. Exactly. Yeah. So now you got that to throw into the mix too. So again, I think what happened was is that uh, they did get some people that were probably connected to the assassination, that included Charles Harrelson. But then, because all of this is being orchestrated from the very top of the power structure, there you know the low-level cops and district attorneys and stuff are told, no, never mind. These guys are okay. We have checked them out, and pff, they're out of there. Okay. Yeah. And then what they did was, in fact, they may have even arranged for these three uh, other tramps to get erected, arrested a little later that afternoon so that in the future they can come back and say, oh, it was them. Yeah, right. Well, so they have some real tramps thrown in there with these hitmen, basically. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, but the idea that Lansdale would be walking by the tramps puts them on kind of a pretty important level because if exactly. it is, if it was Lansdale, then he was trying to say, "Don't blow your cool" or "Everything's okay." That seems to be the idea. You know, they apparently he made like a little motion with his hand or something like that. It's like, you know, just chill out, stay cool. We'll get you out of this, and they did. So your impression is that it was probably Harrelson, and there probably is some significance to the tramp story. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think it was Harrelson, and I think it was... Uh, well, you got Harold Doyle, who was... Harold Doyle, and, uh, yeah. Then they, and, they uh, were saying it was E. Howard Hunt, but that's, no, that's a stretch, no, it's not right? Hunt. I yeah. can point Hunt out to you, though. Okay. There's a, there's a picture taken In Dilly of Plaza. the crowd coming towards the grassy knoll. And uh, up to the extreme right-hand he- he- corner is a guy walking along with a uh, tan trench coat on and a slouch hat with his hands in his pocket. And uh, uh, it, he definitely looks like Hunt. And, in fact, Hunt's son, St. John Hunt, yeah. uh, had a copy of that picture. He said, that's my dad. He said, and I recognize that, that uh, trench coat because he loved it, wore it all the time. Uh, well, and, there, were, uh, there were a lot of people in the plaza who were... Uh, very high level, and it's a, exactly. Yeah. Oh no, it, it was almost a, a, a spook convention. You know? Yeah, I mean, they had. I'm sure KGB agents were there. Yeah. Uh, Mossad agents were there. Castro agents were there. I think everybody came to see what was going to go well, on. Well, you mentioned one that's very important, which is uh, Michael Mertz, who they actually they arrested him, right, and then deported him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's I think very important because. The way that you track back Mertz is that he's uh, related to the same type of assassination cabal that went after de Gaulle. Right. So that's that's very important that he's just sort of hanging around in Dallas for no apparent reason. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, see, uh, here's the, the bottom line is simply this, Daniel. Yeah. To this very day, 50 years later, there has never been a full-blown, honest, in-depth investigation. Yeah. It's true. Never. That's why, you know, the, the closest they came was the garrison trial. That's so I and and then see he got defeated real quick. They it only took him about an hour to find Clay Shaw not guilty, although the jury was polled and unanimously said that Garrison had proven to them that there was a conspiracy. Uh, they were just not convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, Clay Shaw was a member of that. And I, I have to kind of grudgingly agree w- with that uh, jury verdict, okay, uh, because actually when you get down to it, it's really fascinating to learn about all the connections between Bannister and Ferry and, and uh, yeah. uh, uh, Clay Shaw and Oswald and all this stuff that was going on in New Orleans. But... If you get right down to it, lay it all bare, There, other than Oswald, there's no way to connect any of that to Dealey Plaza. Yeah, yeah. And so in a way, the Garrison case helped to expose the New Orleans the aspect. Yeah. Yeah. But so the case itself, it, it almost doesn't matter that he didn't win in that sense. That's right. Um, well, he got, it in, he got it into a courtroom. In fact, the only reason that we have this Zapruder film to view publicly today is because Jim Garrison subpoenaed it. Right. And and they, in time life, fought it all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, here's a tricky one. The Zapruder film exposes the lies of the official story by showing JFK struck from the front. But many experts say the film was altered by intelligence teams. Why would they do that? Oh, well, I think now there's no question in my mind because uh, if you'll check with Doug Horn the military analysts for the um, assassination records review board, uh-huh. they now have talked to the men. And see, when I first wrote Crossfire, I raised the questions about the authenticity of the Zabruder film. Right. But, it, but at that time, it was kind of like one expert against another expert, and, you know, <laughs> who knows. But now, today, there's no question in my mind that the Zabruder film was altered prior to going to Time Life, which was on Monday following the assassination. Because we know on Saturday it was at the National Photographic uh, Interpretation Center of the CIA in Upper State New York. And then there were people there who claimed that it had come from an even more secret Kodak processing place called the Hawkeye Plant. 
and uh, and apparently there were several versions made. We also know that two of the men who are now on the record saying, yeah, I was there when we worked on it, okay? Uh-huh. We also know that they had st- certain still frames blown up and used as um, a presentation boards, I guess you'd say. And that the, these were prepared and were supposed to go to President Johnson, but he didn't want to look at them. And so they ended up turning them over to the head of the CIA. Oh. Now, this to me is really, really interesting because, as Jack White explained to me, that, you know, they claim that the proof film is unaltered because they've got the, uh, they say they've got duplicates of the original film and it includes the sprocket holes and the, and the manufacturer's marks and stuff, and then plus uh, little scratches and stuff that indicates that it came from a Zapruder's ca- camera. Okay, but here's how simple it is. And, and that Super 8 millimeter, you know, the, the frame size on that is, God, I don't know what, like a sixteenth of an inch by a sixteenth of an inch or something like that. <laughs> very, very tiny. Yeah. And they say, you, you, you can't alter something like that. Yeah, but wait a minute. Chester Brenneman... And Robert West, the two surveyors in Dallas, said that on Monday following the assassination, they were hired by Time Life to do surveying work in Dewey Plaza to get the distances, heights, and trajectories and uh-huh. things. And so like a survey given, group. Yeah, and that they were given uh, 8 by 10 color prints of each frame of the Zapruder film. Wow. Wow. And yeah. now we find out that they had these presentation boards prepared. So here's what happens. You take that the critical 16 frames of the Zapruder film, you blow it up to uh, 8 by 10 color photograph print copies, and now you can work with that. You can paint things out. You can shift uh, the uh, frame. You can uh, you know, right. airbrush stuff out. You sure. can do anything you want to with it to a certain extent. That's when they... And they're very crudely uh, airbrush a dark spot on the back of Kenny's head, yeah. so you couldn't see the hole. Okay, and uh, that was described by every medical person in Dallas. Uh, and then, and then what you do is once you've got you, your uh, uh, color uh, prints ready, then you shoot it frame by frame with the Zapruder camera. And then when you run it as a film, it looks like a, an altered film. And it can be traced to that camera. So what are the important things that they changed? Well, they put the, the black spot in the back of Kenny's head to cover up the gaping wound in the back of the head, which indicates a front shot. And right. The shot to the front. Uh, I think they tilted the thing down to uh, eliminate some of the background so that when the background got changed, see, they have done subtle. They tried to, they would love to destroy Dealey Plaza as evidence. But they couldn't quite get away with that. So what they've done is a few little subtle things. There was a manhole cover there for a storm drain that several people claimed that uh, somebody was firing from out of there. That's been cemented over. It's not there anymore. Uh, They've closed up the big uh, gap in the fence on the grassy knoll. Uh, They have uh, obscured the uh, yellow marks on the curb on the south side of Elm Street, although you can still see vestiges of the uh-huh. paint, yellow paint there, uh, which was marking the kill zone. And, uh, oh, and they've moved some light lamp posts around so that when you try to correlate it with the photographs in 63, they don't quite line up, which is just, you know, just enough to confuse the average person who's trying to put some stuff together. I gotcha. And do you think that the, um, did they put the sign in? Uh, they they made the sign look like it hadn't been hit by a bullet, or is that... No, they just took it down. It disappeared. <laughs> it, it disappeared within a few days, and uh, and nobody knows. I, I checked with the uh, uh, Texas uh, Department of Transportation, which is the only ones that have authority over those highway signs, and they said, no, we didn't take it down. We don't know what happened to it. Now, what's interesting is uh, after mentioning that particular issue, on a radio program or something, I got a, uh, I got an email from a guy who said that he was in Dallas at the time and that he distinctly remembered seeing a news item on uh, Channel 8, I believe, WFAA, um, like a week or so after the assassination, and it, it showed him, it said the city had taken down the sign, 
because they didn't want the bullet holes to remind everyone of the tragedy that took place in Dewey Plaza. Oh, Oops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So, no, so there's two things. Now we know that it, it was under some authority, legal or otherwise, that took down the sign, and two, that there was a bullet mark on it, just yeah. exactly as several people said. Well, Jim, with all your research in the case, when you look at the Zabruder film, how do you think you know, the shots work out? Do you think there's shot from the back, two shots from the front? Well, okay, I'll tell you, but uh, it's all this is all just supposition, okay. right? Uh, it, the the main thing is is that don't, let's not worry about how many shots and from where. Yeah. All we got to worry about is was it a lone nut or not? Well, right. if it was not, then it's a conspiracy. Exactly. If it's a conspiracy, then who could have covered up this conspiracy for fifty years? And the answer is only highest levels of the federal government of the United States. This is what proves it was a coup d'état. But to answer your question. If you've got two separate sets of acoustical scientists who told the House Assassination uh, Committee that uh, there were as many as nine or even maybe ten shots fired that they could, or sounds on these, the dicta belt that they could not rule out as being a gunshot. Now, the problem was they only test fired from the sixth floor of the book depository and from behind the pick of pence on the grassy knoll. Uh. So it was only from those two locations that they could say emphatically that shots came from those two locations, yeah. at least one coming from the Gracie Knoll. Now, I, I suggest that if they had test fired from other locations, the south side of, uh, of the plaza or from the Daltex building or from the top of the county records building, that they might have identified another location where more shots came from. Now, <clears throat> so... But basically, so you could have as many as nine shots, and uh, but nine shots, can we account for them? And I suggest, yes, we can. Um, for one thing, if you figure, why would Oswald wait when the car, if he's in the sixth floor of the book depository and the car is coming straight at him on Houston Street, that's your shot because you have a stationary target. Right. Coming I mean, right at you, you know. Why would he wait until the car turned under him and then went downhill laterally away from him on a slope with a tree intervening in the line of sight to take his shot? <laughs> and there's no reason for that. And the only reason is they had to put him uh, in that location so they could get a triangulation of fire, All which right. is standard ambush sniper technique, okay? okay? Now, so if you figure that they were doing the typical military ambush style, a triangulation of fire, well, then by definition, that means there's three shooters. Okay, and in right. fact, I think actually we've got probably six because you've got two, three teams. Okay, you got a shooter and then you got a backup guy, just like just like we do with our snipers today, right? Yeah. Okay, so you got so you got three shooters from three separate locations, catching him in a triangulation of fire. Okay, uh, one shot uh, hits him in the back. That's the one that worked its way out, or they took it out. Right. One hits him in the front of the throat. There's two. One hits him in the side of the head. There's three. Okay. Actually, this could have been, I think there were two shots hit him in the right hand side of the head almost simultaneously because in the Zapruder film, his head moves forward very violently for just a split second before he's thrown to the rear. So I think he got hit almost simultaneously in the head with these two shots, but the last one coming in is the came from the knoll, and it pushed him to the left rear and, and, uh, and into the seat. So there's one, two, three, four shots. Then you got uh, two shots that hit Connolly, one that went through his uh, chest uh, and... Uh, then you got one that came from the right, went to his wrist, and ended up his left leg. Mm. So there's the two, three, four, five, six. You got one that hit the sign. There's seven. You got one that hit the street. There's eight. Yeah. And then you got one that missed and hit down near the triple underpass and nicked up some concrete that uh, that uh, bloodied uh, Jim Tag's cheek. Nine, nine shots. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, that sounds more like what they were doing there and how they were able to pull it off rather than right. a lucky shot out of the blue, right? <laughs> You're right. Well, you know, you would never trust a lucky shot on something that's <laughs> important. The, uh, the badge man photo would be probably the best evidence of visual yeah. evidence of somebody shooting. But the guy who right. developed it, you, 
you go into this, I think it's fascinating about Gary Mack. And that's Gary Mack, who now is the director of the Sixth Floor Museum there. That seems very unusual. Uh, and especially... <laughs> well, it's not unusual if you had lived through the whole thing. Because <laughs> uh, Gary Mack, who, who at one point was very pro-conspiracy, in fact, was instrumental in bringing a number of important issues to the front, the badge man photograph being one of them, yeah. the uh, police acoustical uh, study, the, uh, the Dallas Police Dick Belt. Uh, he was instrumental in that and uh, was really doing some good. And then, uh, but at that time, he was married, had a nice house in the suburbs, and had a nice job with a TV station as an archivist and blah, blah, blah. And the next thing you knew, he loses all of that. Uh, he's out of a job, and the next thing you know, he's hired as the archivist for the Sixth Floor Museum, and he changes his tune. Yeah, and he starts saying, well, I don't really believe that there was a conspiracy. There's no proof of that. And <laughs> right. This is very... <laughs> here's, the, here's the guy who provided <laughs> all this stuff, and the killer is that he was featured in a uh, TV documentary few years back called Inside the Target Car or something like that. Yeah. And in there, they've got him up on the grassy knoll in a totally different place, different location from the badge man photograph. Yeah. Saying some people said there were people up here on this knoll shooting, but here we are. There's nobody here. There was nobody here, folks, <laughs> basically. Wow. <laughs> Gary, you scum. Wow. You're the one that helped put the photograph out that shows exactly. him that he's not this location. He's over on the, the north-south leg of this fence. Well, he, he had to. I mean, apparently uh, he was co-opted. They had to co-opt yeah. him. They co-opted yeah. him because he had that badge man reputation, which is he did bring yeah. that out. And I still think when you look at that, that looks to me like evidence. Oh, it is. I, I, there's no question in my <laughs> mind about that. Yeah. And the thing is, they've done so much testing on that. They got the exact same type Polaroid camera and stood at the exact same location that Mary Mormon was in and took a picture of a guy up behind the fence where they had figured this badge man photograph figure was. And sure enough, the camera's lens is good enough to pick all that up. He, he, you know, that's it. And then I know years ago I, when I made a presentation to the uh, uh, medical examiner investigators, and these were mostly uh, cops, uh, anyway, trained professional investigators, uh, who go out and examine, you know, when there's a death, they go out to determine, you know, if there's anything funny about it, is this suicide, homicide, right. accident. And uh, so I made a presentation to these guys, most of whom I knew, because uh, I'd known them when they were detectives with Fort Worth Police Department. And they all just said, yeah, there's a guy firing a gun. <laughs> you know, hello. And one of them said, look, I think he's wearing shooter's glasses. <laughs> oh, they were that interesting. Wow. They were that confident with it. So how does it feel when you see people like Gary Mack out there who have switched sides on this and you've done all this research that shows it was a conspiracy? And I mean, you've worked uh, closely mm -hmm. with these guys mm -hmm. over the years. Does it feel like a betrayal? Well, here's the thing. Uh, there was another guy named Jim Moore who wrote a book called Conspiracy of One. I always love I always love that title. <laughs> <laughs> That's as good as the lone gunman. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, and he, it was arguing that no, 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 it's held up and as Oswald did it. And I debated Jim on several different occasions and usually just ripped him up one side and down the other because I had my facts and he had just a few facts. And, uh, but I never could get, I never could get upset with uh, Jim Moore because uh, to the best of my knowledge, I think he truly believed this, what he was doing, okay. you know? Yeah. Now you get people like Gary Mack, they know better. Yes. They know better. But uh, for whatever reasons, and, you know, I don't know if it's coercion, I don't know if it's a good, 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 good go along to get along, or, or whether they're being paid, or whether they're just bucking for uh, a better job. I You know, I have no idea. I'm not going to try to put any uh, uh, motivation. Uh-huh. But they know better, and yet they stick with this uh, uh, phony story. When I say phony story, I think I, I am more or less being vindicated today because even though here on the 50th anniversary you had a whole spate of, of uh, official you know, documentaries and retrospectives, <laughs> 
on TV, and of course the major media all did some kind of something, and it was all geared towards, uh, I guess we'll never know, and we just need to bind up the wounds, yeah. and, and blah, 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 <laughs> and there's still controversy, folks, and, right. you know, uh, <laughs> so they just, it, it's just go along to get along, I guess. That's true. But, the, but I do get irked at people who I feel like know better. Yeah. Uh, if you, if you dis if you disagree with me, uh, that's okay, and we can disagree without being disagreeable. That's true. Um, and I'm certainly willing to listen to any argument you may have. In fact, I like to pride myself on on thinking that if you can show me the error of my ways and where some fact that I'm stating is wrong, I'll be the first one to say, "Hey, I was wrong about that," you know, and I have been wrong about some things. Right. But but not very much that gets into print because, as you know from our conversations. I've already told you two and three examples of things that I happen to know, but I don't write about because I can't prove it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it seems like these people who switch and change their tune, suddenly they come into a better position, a better life, uh -huh. better money. And yeah, they seem to do quite well. So it seems like there is still a mechanism that's working there that wants to keep that story where it is. Exactly. Let's run through just a few of the more interesting witnesses who came forward and said there were other shooters on the scene that day. I know we just recently lost uh, James Tagg, who was nicked by a bullet at the scene, and there were other witnesses that we know were just disposed of for what they saw. So I'd like to get your opinion on some of the more controversial ones, like Gordon Arnold, who claimed he was shooting video from the grassy knoll when shots came from behind him. What do you think of Gordon Arnold? Uh, that's a pretty good question, too. Uh, I think that in the main that he's probably uh, telling the truth uh, simply because there is uh, photographic evidence and other evidence uh, indicate that supports his story. Uh, but then on the other hand, it's, he's like any other witness. You just have to, uh, you have to take his story and then uh, uh, apply that to uh, all of the rest of the information and knowledge we have and just see, you know, does it fit, does it not fit, and uh, just kind of yeah. go on. See, I, I, uh, I, the, there's two ways of looking at, at evidence, uh, particularly at witness testimony. Uh, you can either take the uh, optimist view, which I tend to do, which is I tend to believe people, okay? Sure until they can be proven wrong. And after that, I don't pay attention to them because I don't deal with liars. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, or you can take the cynical view, which unfortunately so many people do, which is to say, well, they're lying, right? And just assume they're lying right off the bat until you can somehow prove to them that it's true. Uh, you know, that's why there's still controversy over uh, uh, the babushka lady. Uh, yeah, Beverly Oliver. Beverly Oliver, you know, I've met Beverly on several different occasions, <laughs> been with her on in formal interview and also in social situations, and I can't help but like old Beverly, sure. you know, and, uh, but there's controversy there because there's people like me who say, well, she tells a coherent story and it's internally consistent and she's got some evidence to support what she's saying and it all makes sense and it all answers the questions and until somebody else comes forward and said, no, no, wait a minute, that was me, then I'm going to accept that she's the babushka lady, sure. okay? Unlike, but then you got a whole bunch of other people and going, well, I don't like the color of that coat, and, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, she's just trying to make some money, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah. You know, and, they, and so they assume that she's bogus until somebody can prove to them that she's not, and so all it does is just create an ongoing controversy, which, by the way, if I haven't mentioned it, is the methodology of cover-up in this case. There's never been a cover-up in the classic sense of lack of information. Quite, it's, in fact, it's quite the opposite. This is cover-up by obfuscation. They just throw out so much crap and, and charge and counter-charge and claim and counter-claim, you know, that the average person just goes out, turns off, and says, that's it, I don't want to hear anymore. Too I, much. I, it's I'm overstimulating. Too much. Yeah. yeah, it's got me confused. You know, it hurts my head. I don't want <laughs> at the end of that. So that, that's been the cover-up. Well, it's an excellent way to work because it has, it has achieved that goal. Uh, there it's are, worked quite well, yeah. Some of those witnesses, you know, and I, I, I appreciate the way that you go about it, which is you trust them until you have evidence not to trust them. I think that's a better way to go. 
Um, I think so. And there are witnesses who just, it just seems too good to be true, right? You know, uh, James Files. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think mm -hmm. Chauncey, Chauncey Holt Chauncey is Holt. interesting. Yeah, Chauncey Holt. That's who I was trying to think of. I think he was the other tramp. He's the old guy tramp. Okay. And his, his daughter seems to think so, too. He looks a lot like him. He does. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we have every reason to believe that Chauncey Holt was in the area at the time. Right. In fact, it's Chauncey Holt who said that he was uh, working up the Secret Service identification. And that's another issue that is well documented and never explained which is there were a lot of people, including Dallas police officers, who claimed they encountered men in suits on the grassy knoll and in other areas who uh, claimed to be Secret Service, showed them identification. Uh -huh. And yet, there were, according to the Secret Service, all their agents were either riding in the motorcade or already at the trademark. There were no Secret Service agents on the ground in Dewey Plaza. So who were these men, and where did they get uh, Secret Service identification that was at least good enough to fool the Dallas policemen? So they were impersonating. Which, which yeah. probably didn't take a whole lot. But. <laughs> <laughs> but they had to be pretty good. But they had to have something, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, are you aware that one of the people who encountered a Secret Service agent was Lee Harvey Oswald? Right. When did that happen? Yeah, just a minute. Let me find this for you real quick. Great. I think I, think I can find it. Okay, this is back. Uh, you can look back in the appendices of the... Uh, uh, the Warren Commission, you find uh, Secret Service Inspector Thomas Kelly's interview with Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. Um, and he says, uh, quoting here, at that time he, meaning Oswald, asked me whether I was an FBI agent, and I said that I was not, that I was a member of the Secret Service. And he said he was, when he was standing in front of the textbook building and about to leave it, a young crew cut man rushed up to him and said he was from the Secret Service showed a book of identification and asked him where the phone was. Oswald said he pointed toward the payphone in the building and that he saw the man actually go to the phone before he left. That's incredible. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We're told that, you know, less than an hour later, a cop stops him in South Oak Cliff. He shoots him. Right. And here's the guy who comes up to him and says, Secret Service, and he, he shows him where the payphone is. <laughs> right. But the, key th but the key thing is, is that the crew cut man... That sounds about right. Yeah. And showed him a book of identification. Now, at that time, I was a journalist. I carried a press card. Uh -huh. But it was a press card. And I'd stick it in my hat. I'd stick it in my pocket. You know, it was just a press card. Who carries a book of identification? FBI, Secret Service. Right. They got those little leather binding things. It's official. Things, you yeah. know, with a badge and their ID on it and everything. Uh. But now, of course, this... Up was published in the Warren Commission. What are they going to do about that? What if somebody reads this and says, wait a minute, Oswald, he didn't flee. He didn't sneak away. In fact, he helped the Secret Service agent. <laughs> Got to do something about that. So here's what they did, and it's amazing, but this is how the, the government gets us to doubt ourselves. Okay. Um, when the Sixth Floor Museum first opened, I went up there, took a little tour, got one of those little recorders, uh, tape recorder things, and some earphones, and then you'd listen to this spiel, and it was by a guy named Pierce Allman, who was a newsman, okay. who, uh, who was one of the newsmen who covered the assassination that day. And in, the, uh, in this uh, talk and tour of the sixth floor, he says, you know, he says, uh, actually, I encountered the assassin, although I didn't remember that. He said months after the assassination, the Secret Service came to him and said that uh, he had encountered Oswald uh, coming out of the school book depository. Uh, he said, because weren't you searching for a phone? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was. Well, that was you. So he was all real proud. He said, wow, I actually got to encounter Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, the, <laughs> the trouble is, is that uh, um, Ta uh, McNeil of McNeil Lair Report. Yes. Yeah, now he's on record saying that, you know, I met the assassin. He said a few months afterwards, I didn't really remember this, but the Secret Service came to me and said, you know, uh, when you were looking for a telephone, you encountered Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh. And they implanted that in his head, and now he still tells that story, even though by his own initial account, he didn't remember it. Wow. <laughs> and so see, and so now if somebody brings this up and says, well, wait a minute, Oswald encountered a Secret Service agent, 
uh, leaving the book depository, they go, oh, no, 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 that was just amusement. Oh, it's a reporter. No big deal. Yeah, it's a reporter. Oh. No big deal. That's See? fascinating. Yeah. Isn't well, that that's... amazing? And then, and then you got guys like, uh, um, oh, uh, the guy on the railroad bridge, uh, Sam Holland. Okay. And, and in 66, when it should be still pretty fresh on his mind, and Mark Lane's interviewing him, and he says, so, uh, you know, so uh, where do you think the shots came from? He said, well, I think it came from over there behind that fence on that grassy knoll. He says, is that where you believe today? He says, well, no. He says, well, where do you believe it came from today? He says, well, I, I guess it came from the sixth floor of the school book depository. And he said, well, you know, why do you believe that? He said, well, the government investigated, and they said that's where it took place, so I guess it is. So here's here's a guy who's been led to to doubt his own senses. You know? Unbelievable. Who are you who are you gonna believe? Your government or your own lying eyes? <laughs> well the suggestion is strong enough that they start to doubt their own senses somehow. Exactly. Yeah. Well and it's peer pressure. You know, every the media, hence the public and the government and the president of the United States, holy cow, they're all saying two, two is five. Gee, I guess it must be two and two is five. <laughs> right. Well it does Amazing. seem it does seem like there was a watershed moment there in the early nineties when you came out uh, with Crossfire and Oliver Stone made JFK based on that and they made the ARRB. That's a huge um, yes. that's a huge moment and I think a lot came out of that. So there it was did. Yeah, but a lot of that is not still not been reported. Well, Jim, you've done a lot to get the truth out there about the covert groups that participated in the JFK assassination. As we close out the show today, uh, can you give us your final thoughts on this? Well, here's the thing: I've had people say, "Well, you know, 25 words or less." What, what, what happened to Kennedy? And okay. so I told them, "Okay, it was Kennedy was shaking up the status quo, and the status quo struck back." Yeah. 25 words or less. Huh. Well, that sounds right to me. Thanks so much for coming on, Jim, and sharing this with us. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye-bye.